For part three of chapter seven, we're going to discuss Lewis structures, which are without a doubt the most important idea to come from chapter seven. Understanding Lewis structures, understanding the octet rule, which we'll have in this video, and understanding formal charges, resonance, and molecular structure and polarity, which will follow in videos four and five. You will absolutely need to know how to draw Lewis structures on the quiz or test for this chapter, and you'll have plenty of practice on your sapling homework as well. In the previous video, we looked at Lewis symbols, which are just for individual atoms or ions. Now, in a Lewis structure, we're showing bonding and electron activity in both molecules and polyatomic ions. Now, for the sake of Gen Chem 1, we're going to focus only on compounds that are in main group elements. Okay? And because we're looking at molecules, we're really just focusing on groups 13 through 18. And when we draw a Lewis structure, we show the arrangement of all the valence electrons that belong to all the different atoms in that molecule, in that covalent compound whether they are in bonds or contained as lone pairs belonging only to that atom. So here we see some Lewis structures that we've seen before for H2 and HF. Now, most of the time, and in everything you'll be tested on from chapter seven, our electrons in Lewis structures are occurring in pairs. And those pairs can show up in one of two ways. They can show up in a bond, okay, which we show as a straight line between two atoms, what we see here and what we see down here. Okay. And they can also be unshared. Okay. And when those are unshared, they're not between the two, right? We just show them as two dots belonging to only that. So here I have a lone pair that belongs to just fluorine. Okay? Those guys aren't involved in bonding. They're not shared between the two. They belong only to fluorine. Whereas this bonded pair of electrons belong to both hydrogen and fluorine simultaneously. And paying attention to those pairs of electrons is important because as we've discussed at the beginning of the chapter, we bond in ways so that we are become isoelectronic with a noble gas. Our noble gases have eight valence electrons, so that ties into what we use in Lewis structures called the octet rule. Okay. And the octet rule says that everything will be working in this chapter except for hydrogen, bond to form molecules in a variety of ways, and they share electrons so that at the end of the day, they end up being surrounded by eight valence electrons because when they're surrounded by eight valence electrons they have the same configuration as a noble gas and they have that inherent stability okay. now hydrogen doesn't need a full eight we see hydrogen just forming one bond pretty much all the time because with that one bond it has two elect electrons and it's isoelectronic with helium okay. so it's in business hydrogen is happy just having the two electrons belonging to each of them Right, two electrons belonging to hydrogen here, remembering that they're shared. Fluorine is following the octet rule. It's surrounded by two electrons in the bond, four, six, eight total, keeping in mind each one of those dots represents an electron. And we can satisfy the octet rule in a variety of ways, right? Because we've got combinations of bonds and lone pairs. We can have things that form four bonds and have no lone pairs. That's what carbon likes to do. We could have three bonds and one lone pair of electrons. Keeping in mind three bonds, right? Two electrons apiece is six. One lone pair of two electrons, six plus two is eight. Each one of these combinations has eight electrons. Nitrogen likes to do three bonds and one lone pair. Oxygen, two bonds, two lone pairs. Fluorine, one bond, three lone pairs. And any of the noble gases have no bonds and four lone pairs. We can also have double bonds and triple bonds. Double bonds count for four electrons. Triple bonds count for six electrons. And those bonds are still shared between the atoms. Anything below these guys, 
would follow the same type of activity. So if phosphorus is below nitrogen, it also typically likes to form three bonds and have one lone pair. Here we see a couple of examples of Lewis structures, H2O, OH minus, hydroxide, and NH4 plus, ammonium. Each of these satisfy the octet rule for everything other than hydrogen. Here I see oxygen okay, with three lone pairs and one bond. Here I see oxygen with two lone pairs and two bonds. Over here, nitrogen has four bonds surrounding it. Those are all different ways to satisfy the octet rule. And here are some examples with the higher order bonds, double bonds and triple bonds. Keep in mind that each line represents two electrons. So here carbon, for example, is surrounded by two, four, six, eight. Same thing for this other carbon. Over here, two, four, six in the bond, two outside. Each of these carbons also satisfy the octet rule. And in chapter seven, you will certainly want to know how to write Lewis structures. And there's a set of rules that you'll use to develop these. Okay. Rule number one is to determine the total number of valence electrons. Okay. So we take everything that's in the, the molecule, okay. figure out how many valence electrons each one of the atoms at, has, and add them all together. That's the total valence electron count. Now, if I'm dealing with a polyatomic ion, that number can vary a little bit, okay? If it's a polyatomic cation, I subtract one electron for each positive charge. Okay? So ammonium, for example, has a plus one charge, so I would subtract one electron. If it's a polyatomic anion, I add an electron for each negative charge. So sulfate, for example, has a minus two charge, so I add in two extra electrons to the total count. Then I draw what's known as a skeletal structure of the molecule or polyatomic ion, which is where I just connect everything with a single bond. I have one thing in the middle and everything is connected outside of that. The challenge sometimes is determining what goes in the middle. Okay? So if you have one thing that's less electronegative, that's gonna go in the middle. Another hint that doesn't work every time, but most of the time it'll work, if there's something that's listed by itself or it's listed first in the molecular formula, that's typically the thing that's going in the middle. But the hard and fast rule to be 100% certain is the thing that it's, is least electronegative. Then when I do that and I've determined the skeletal structure, I've got three more rules. Okay. Chances are after that, not always, but chances are, I still have some electrons left over. I haven't used them all up. So I distribute those as lone pairs on the terminal atoms okay, to fill the octet for everything that's on the outside. I'm not paying attention to the guy who's in the middle right now. And I fill in electrons until I've completed the octet around each of the atoms on the terminal. Then if I have any electrons left over after that, I put them on the center atom. Then after I've used up all of my electrons, right, after step four, you should have used up all the electrons, no matter how many you began with. You started with 10, you started with 18, you started with 32, you've used them all up. Rule five tells us we then have to look at what we're dealing with, okay? If any atom at that point doesn't have an octet, then you have to rearrange some of your lone pairs on your terminal atoms and move them in to make multiple bonds. So those are our higher order bonds, a double bond or a triple bond. Then the electrons have to be shared so that everybody has an octet at the end of the day, except hydrogen, of course. Okay. So that's a lot of the fundamental information, what we've covered thus far in this video and the preceding two videos. So in the middle of the chapter here, I've added some slides to reflect on those ideas. And as we go through these, right, I'll pull the question up, pause the video, think about it, and then I'll give you the answer. Here we're asked which element is most electronegative. We should know that trend from the first video. And that answer is C, fluorine. This question asks us how many valence electrons does carbon have? 
that's a really useful skill to have. You need that to quickly be able to draw Lewis structures. And the answer to this question, how many valence electrons does carbon have, is B, four. Here we're asked, which element has the tendency to gain electrons when forming an ion? <clears throat> this is differentiating between metals and nonmetals. Different way to ask this is which one of these forms an anion? Because okay, the other three typically form cations. And the answer to this one is A, bromine. Okay, bromine likes to gain one electron to form bromide, which is Br minus. This question asks us, what would form an ionic bond? This is a definition we've had for a while. You can only form an ionic bond from a metal and a non-metal. So the only option here would be B to form an ionic bond. A, C, and D are combinations of non-metals, so those would form covalent bonds. This question asks you to practice drawing the Lewis structures for ammonia and formaldehyde. You should practice drawing these out on a piece of paper. Okay, so pause the video and give that one a shot. <clears throat> I'll do ammonia first. Okay. Nitrogen goes in the middle. Okay. It's surrounded by three hydrogens. Now my total valence electron count, nitrogen has five, each of the hydrogens has one, so I have eight total. First thing I'm doing is drawing my skeletal structure, which is connecting everything with a single bond. Each one of those single bonds takes up two electrons, so I've used up two, four, six electrons, right? Eight minus six, I have two left. I don't have any octets to complete on the outside because those are all hydrogens. So my seventh and eighth electrons go on nitrogen. Now everybody has an octet and I'm happy. For formaldehyde, carbon goes in the middle. It's surrounded by oxygen and two hydrogens. Now my valence electron count, four from carbon, each of the hydrogens has one, so that's four, five, six. Oxygen has six valence electrons on its own, so that's a total of 12. When I go and do my skeletal structure here, everybody gets a single bond. Right, so now I've used up, I had 12 to start with, I've used up six, I have six left over. Following the rules after my skeletal structure, I'm told to complete the octet on everything on the outside that's not hydrogen. So I have to complete the octet of oxygen here. Okay. And when I do that, I've used up six electrons. I have none left which might seem like a good thing, right? but I've not completed the octet of carbon. Rule five tells me to check my octets. Because carbon doesn't have an octet, I have to move one of these bonds down and make a double bond. So the correct Lewis structure of formaldehyde, you'll probably wanna Google it to get a clearer picture here, other than my rough sketches. Right? But I've gotta move one of those pairs down Make a double bond there. Here I've still used 12 electrons, but this is the right Lewis structure because everybody has the proper octet except for hydrogen because it doesn't need it. This one would be incorrect. So you'll have plenty of Lewis structure practice on your sapling as well and see some more as we move through video three and then in video four and five as well because formal charge, the first idea in video four, continues with these thoughts. Okay. Now there are some exceptions to the octet rule. Okay. One of those things that we may encounter, nothing that would be tested or on a quiz or a test in Gen Chem 1, but they do exist, is when we have an odd number of valence electrons. If I have an odd number of electrons, it's impossible to pair everything up. So it's impossible to satisfy the octet rule. Okay. And those species are known as free radicals. Okay. When you encounter those situations, you just try and get as close to eight to satisfy the octet rule as possible. But notice in this Lewis structure here, 
nitrogen only has seven electrons surrounding it. The more common things that will be tested this semester are these two down here. Sometimes a Lewis structure has fewer than eight electrons surrounding an atom. Those are known as electron deficient molecules. Sometimes it has more than eight, it's exceeded the octet. Those are known as hypervalent molecules and you should know those definitions. Less than eight, electron deficient. More than eight, hypervalent. Okay. When we have things that are electron deficient, it's most commonly surrounded by four or six electrons. And we see those a lot right, with beryllium and boron. Taking BEF2, for example, here, the Lewis structure looks like this. And there's a lone pair, three lone pairs on each of the fluorines. So even though they could move some of these electrons in and form higher order bonds, they don't. They're actually happy just having less than the octet. Same thing for boron. It's all, here we're surrounded by four, over here boron surrounded by six. And that's okay. This next slide shows what we would expect for boron, right? It could form a double bond, but it doesn't. It just likes to be surrounded by those six electrons. Boron is okay being electron deficient. What about things that are hypervalent? Yep. What's important to know is that not everything can be hypervalent. Yep. But I'll come back to this slide. Right, notice it starts with phosphorus. It's only things with an atomic number higher than phosphorus that can be hypervalent. So nitrogen, for example, cannot be hypervalent. If something can be hypervalent, if that's allowed, right, the most common thing that we see is that it's surrounded by 10 or 12 electrons. Okay? Because again, that's pairs, extra bonds. And again, we've used that term already, hypervalent. It's more common to see hypervalent molecules than it is electron deficient molecules. So another way to think about this, nothing from period one or period two, the first two rows on the periodic table can be hypervalent. But once we get to phosphorus and higher than that, it's allowed. And this is what hypervalent molecules look like. Right here, sulfur is surrounded by 12 electrons. It's hypervalent. Phosphorus, is surrounded by 10 and those are stable. There is one thing that's missing on this slide. Each of these fluorines should be surrounded by three lone pairs so that they've also satisfied their octet. Okay. So know how to do Lewis structures from this video for sure. Know the octet rule, no electron deficient, no hypervalent. In the next video, we'll discuss the idea of formal charge and how to be confident that when you're electron deficient or hypervalent, or if you encounter a situation where you have a couple of different possible Lewis structures, how to be confident in your answer.